Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. This is Liam Sanyo from Inside Scientific, and I'm very pleased to be your host for today's event, which is titled EEG Monitoring Approaches to Predict Learning and Memory Changes in Early Alzheimer's Disease. This webinar has been sponsored by DSI, a division of Harvard Bioscience, so a big thanks to them for making this event possible. Today, we're being joined by Dr. Fiona Harrison, Associate Professor of Medicine at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Dr. Harrison will discuss how vitamin C deficiency and exposure to toxins can impact glutamate uptake and clearance, and how even small changes in neural signaling can be detected by monitoring EEG activity and correlated with performance in learning and memory tasks. And with that, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Fiona Harrison. Fiona, thanks so much for joining us today. And the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Well, thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Liam. Um, I'm delighted to be here today to share some of the recent work from my group, trying to better understand how changes in epileptiform activity may be associated with cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias. So my lab is primarily interested in lifestyle differences such as diet, environmental exposures to toxins and other illnesses or comorbidities that can uh, impact the trajectory of Alzheimer's disease. So while I'm going to start with a reasonably general story, toward the end of the talk, we will get into some new data to help explain uh, this image that I have here of the mouse in the orange. So I think everyone here is already aware of what a huge and growing problem Alzheimer's disease is uh, in developed countries such as the US, but rates are increasing worldwide. As we get better at curing other diseases, more people live long enough to develop AD. But, uh, you know, we may recover from these other conditions without necessarily staying healthier. So there are many more cofactors increasing rates of diagnosis and lowering the age of onset. So these data from the Alzheimer's Association infographic uh, predict something like one in three people born today will go on to develop some form of dementia as they age. Now, we typically think of Alzheimer's as a disease of aging, but in many ways, it's the culmination of a lifetime's brain health and should perhaps therefore be studied and treated accordingly. So Alzheimer's disease is defined on the presence of uh, beta amyloid plaques in the extracellular space, uh, hyperphosphorylated tau tangles within the neurons and cell loss causing overall shrinkage of the brain parenchyma with increasing ventricle size. The recent controversy regarding the approval of the beta amyloid plaque removing drug aducanumab or aduhelm has really reignited the conversation around the amyloid hypothesis and whether this should still be the focus of so much research. You know, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with that case, but a very simplified summary is that the drug was effective in clearing amyloid plaques in many of the patients, but the risks of side effects, including aria, microbleeds, was high, uh, required careful monitoring during the study, and that's just not feasible in most patient populations. And any cognitive benefits were mild at best and only in a limited number of participants. So this leaves the question, you know, how important amyloid plaques really are in cognitive decline? But one of the interesting and in fact really hopeful facets of Alzheimer's is that there is a huge difference in the clinical manifestation, so the dementia and other behavioral changes that patients experience in relation to the pathology within the brain. So we often see comparable brain atrophy in cognitively normal and impaired adults. And to illustrate this in this data set from several years ago, uh, we have 137 adults imaged for amyloid, and you can see you know, a large spread across the population, including some uh, high amyloid in the older populations. But the key feature here is that all of these participants were cognitively normal when this study was performed. And interestingly, we can also see amyloid is detectable in much younger adults, you know, even if it is at the lower levels detected. Still, Many of the major pathologies known in Alzheimer's are both triggered by amyloid and tau pathology and also serve to accelerate those changes. You know, for example, in the case of microglial response to amyloid, you have a need for activation to clear amyloid, but then that leads to long-term activation, which triggers damage when microglia destroy healthy synapses instead. So it becomes more important to ask how the brain is responding to each of the pathological signs rather than measuring frank levels per se. So in mice, uh, using well-known transgenic models over the past decade and a half, you know, many groups have observed clearer associations between amyloid deposition and behavior. So in the first example here, CRND8 transgenic mice between three and 12 months of age were trained in a conditioned fear task and cognitive deficits increased with age, uh, you know, in line with the age-related amyloid buildup. 
Uh, in the second example, we have performance in 16-month-old TG2576 mice that was assessed uh, using an alternating TMase task. And again, performance was correlated with amyloid deposition. But if these relationships are not true in human populations, then how do we get from the basic pathology to cognitive decline? Now, there are multiple contributing risk factors to cognitive decline that connect the extent of pathological damage observed to the experience of cognitive, emotional, and other behavioral changes experienced by patients. So uh, several of those are listed here, and nutrition here includes both undernutrition and specific dietary deficiencies, as well as overnutrition through high-fat diets and the metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes that are related to that. Exercise, uh, general activity levels, lifetime health history, and continued intellectual and social engagement are all known predictors of an AD diagnosis. We're also now gaining much more information about the importance of sleep in Alzheimer's pathology, um, as well as the possibility of roles of specific environmental toxins. And there are several key areas or themes under investigation across numerous labs right now, uh, with focuses on specific pathways linking these variables and individual differences with amyloid and tau pathology and with clinical memory loss. So each of these pathways that I have uh, listed here uh, you know, has been studied extensively, and yet we're still searching for common links among them, as well as looking for the most predictive biomarkers that could be of use in human populations. You know, to me, the really encouraging thing about Alzheimer's research is that there is so much we can do in our lives to prevent the cognitive decline, or at least slow its onset, even in the face of pathology. And my lab is currently focused on asking how environmental and dietary factors influence one particular facet of the related pathology. And that's the uh, excitotoxicity associated with changes in glutamatergic signaling. But although I am going to focus there today, I will state right now that these changes do not happen in a silo. And all of these other factors listed on this slide are also involved, particularly in this case, uh, neuroinflammation and oxidative damage. So, you know, what are the factors that can determine the relationship between an observable pathology and clinical presentation of cognitive and other behavioral symptoms? So the primary effect of alterations to the glutamate system is, you know, hyperexcitability and in case of, uh, you know, even greater disruption, ultimately leading to seizures. And, you know, by this, I mean cells are firing out of turn with disrupted or asynchronous rhythms. This can be measured at the single cell level in animal studies and at a more global level using EEG in animals and in people. And it's now well known from both animal models of Alzheimer's and observational studies in clinical populations that there is a strong relationship between seizures in Alzheimer's and cognitive decline. But it's a complicated story for which many questions still remain, particularly when those seizures are silent. So epilepsy or subclinical epileptiform activity appears to accelerate onset of cognitive decline by you know, five or more years compared to non-epileptic controls. And in the study I've cited up here by Keith Vossel et al, epileptiform activity was observed in 41% uh, of the, these were non-Alzheimer but mild cognitive impairment patients. And in more than 50% of those cases, the seizures were non-convulsive. So abnormal epileptiform activity without visible convulsions can easily go unrecognized and untreated and may ref uh, re reflect you know, underlying pathologies. To add to the challenge of diagnosing this in patients, such changes may not even be visible on surface EEG and so may require implanted electrodes to fully understand the patterns of altered excitability. Uh, in addition, the greatest changes in epileptiform signaling observed between control and AD populations, and this is in both humans and animal studies, are uh, usually typically observed during sleep, which can further complicate diagnosis. So putting all of this together, it seems that altered epileptiform activity may be both a symptom, but also a driver of cognitive decline. Now, one of the reasons I think that we can have quite good confidence in this line of research uh, is the strong resemblance of the animal models to the clinical phenotypes. And that is not always the case, particularly in the Alzheimer mouse models. But it actually turns out that almost all transgenic mouse models of Alzheimer's have EEG or seizure abnormalities. And importantly, 
you know, it seems that this may be a much more translatable phenotype between the animal models and human disease. Um, and so there is uh, in the um, paper I have cited here, there's a, a list of, it's not a, 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 an exclusive list, but there's a list of many of the models that do show changes in EEG and epileptiform activity. So in this uh, first example here for one of the mouse models, we have um, EEG recorded in anesthetized APP PSM1 mice for 15 minute recordings. The most frequently observed abnormalities in the transgenic mice were the interictal spikes, and those were seen in animals as young as four months. In the second study, we um, see recordings in TG2576 mice that were begun at just five weeks of age, and the transient spike-like activity, you can see that in the left-hand panel marked with the black arrow, um, those were observed in all of the TG2576 mice studied, but none of the wild-type litimates. And mostly those were observed during REM sleep, which you know, fits with the human profile that we observed. The authors also noted that those effects were observed you know, prior to amyloid deposition in this model, but of course that doesn't necessarily mean prior to any amyloidogenic changes, there would still be generation and some accumulation even at that age. So in my lab, uh, we wanted to test the hypothesis that even small disruptions in epileptiform activity would be sufficient to induce or accelerate cognitive decline. And we did this in APP PSM1 mice, which are highly susceptible to seizures and EEG abnormalities anyway, particularly as they get older. But we performed our study in young adult mice between three and six months of age, in which you know, actual plaque deposition is, is very sparse, um, particularly when these mice are on the C57 Black 6J background, which is what we use. I'm going to present three different experiments that we used in this study. And although the specific details of treatments vary for each individual experiment, the overall design is the same. Um, I do need to state that these data are currently unpublished. <laughs> we actually have submitted our second round of revisions um, in response to some really excellent discussion with the reviewers. And uh, we are optimistic that this will be impressed soon. And when that happens, we can add it to the resources site um, that, that you have access to here. So um, kinic acid is a glutamate analog. It's an agonist for the kinase subtype of ionotropic glutamate receptors, and those have the highest density in hippocampus. Uh, the amygdala and various cortical areas also express high levels of the kinate receptor. So these are the areas preferentially affected or damaged after systemic administration of kinic acid. And that's why you know, we thought this would be a useful tool for an Alzheimer's disease related study, um, because these are the areas that are most highly impacted by pathological change. Now, high doses, high concentrations of kinic acid do induce seizures, also cell death and mortality. But we were very careful uh, we try to be very careful to use much lower doses in our studies. We used a repeated dosing strategy in order to model chronic hyperexcitability from young ages. And in each of the data sets that I'm going to present, the data should look the same. So wild type mice will always be in white, transgenic APP PSM1 mice will be in a darker shaded color, and then control or saline treated animals are in black and white, and then any color denotes the experimentally treated groups. So in our first experiment, uh, we were helped by Dr. William Nobis. He's an assistant professor in neurology here at VUMC. We took 12 week old wild type and APP PSM1 mice and treated them for five consecutive days with five mix per kg kinic acid. So that's a very low dose. It does not induce observable seizures in the animals. In fact, you can barely see any behavioral signs of the treatment at all. So as you all know, I'm sure, long-term potentiation, or LTP, is the process of strengthening connections between synapses in response to neural activity. And deficits in LTP are therefore often considered a molecular marker of learning and memory ability. And the field excitatory postsynaptic field potentials, or FEPSPs, were recorded from the CA1 region of the hippocampus uh, by stimulating Schaefer collaterals in the stratum radiatum. And that's the image on the, the top right there for a schematic of, of uh, how we did the LTP. So all of the baseline and control measures uh, that were made were really similar among the groups. 
but kynic acid caused a decrease in the post-tetanic potentiation period around five minutes after stimulation. Um, but those mice had normal appearing late phase LTP. And interestingly, that pattern of kynic acid in wild type mice looked very much like the saline treated APPPSEM1 mice. That's something we had noted before and suggest these changes may be related to alterations in presynaptic release of glutamate, potentially postsynaptic clearance due to the acute kynic acid injection. The similarity between those kynic acid treated wild type mice and the saline treated APPP sum one animals also helped to confirm to us that this type of stimulation protocol was, you know, uh, appropriate for our experiments. But in contrast, um, I think you can see in that red line underneath the, the other main body of the data, the APP piece and one mice that received kynic acid showed really robust impairments in hippocampal LTP. And that suggests uh, to us that, you know, potential impairments in postsynaptic glutamate clearance and also clearly highlights the increased sensitivity to the drug in those mice. We were therefore reasonably confident that our treatments might do something to the learning and memory abilities of the animals. Um, these recordings were made within two hours of the final treatment, so this is catching them in an acute disruption period. We did not look at the mice after washout of the drug as well to see if those effects were persisting. You know, instead, we moved to look at what any behavioral effects of those treatments might be, since that's really the main focus of the lab in these studies. So in the second experiment, we started with mice at the same age, 12 weeks, but this time we treated them with 10 mg per kg kynic acid and we did that twice a week. We thought we would be safer with this slightly higher dose because it still does not cause you know, noticeable behavioral responses or seizure responses. Um, and these treatments were much more spaced out than in the LTP study. Unfortunately, you can see from the panel on the right that despite this low dose, we lost about 80% of the kynic acid treated APPP sum one mice. And I will say in no case did we observe seizures immediately following treatment. The mice died, you know, presumably due to spontaneous seizures in the home cage, um, usually occurring at night during the active phase. So we would find those mice in the mornings. So that meant that after three cohorts um, of mice, we were forced to add a fourth cohort in which we treated animals with an even lower dose, seven and a half mg per kg, in order to provide sufficient power for our studies. Now, we always perform a wide range of tasks, including controls for activity, anxiety, and motor ability. Um, I'm only going to show the key behaviors today as I go through this data set. So first of all, we use the water maze. We train the mice to find the hidden platform uh, in this water maze task. And as you would expect in young five month old mice, even in the transgenic animals, they were all able to perform this task. So they all show decreased escape latency over time. They were uh, also able to show preferential swimming in the target quadrant during the no platform probe trial. So you can see um, the left hand bar in each of those groups of four, the, the uh, diagonally striped bar is much higher than the other three quadrants. And then those heat maps on the right are some examples showing preferential swimming time around where that platform was located. So uh, one good thing about the water maze is that we are able to make it a little more challenging <clears throat> when necessary. So we included reversal learning, um, and in this, the platform is moved to a new location in the pool, although nothing else about the room has changed. And this is actually a lot harder for the mice because they need to not only learn a new platform position, but also uh, remember to forget the old platform position. And although all of our mice were able to acquire the task, which you can see there on the left, again, with decreasing escape latencies, memory for the new location was poorer but only in the kynic acid treated APPP sum one mice. So you can see that in the top right hand panel. So again, the um, target quadrant is marked with the diagonal lines. This time it's the far right bar. And you can see each of the first three groups are able to show preferential swim times, um, which the kynic acid treated transgenic mice did not. Now, you know, this may seem like a trivial difference and in many ways, all of the behaviors I'm going to present today are quite subtle, 
But given these mice were young, otherwise healthy, and in particular, these were the surviving mice in this study. So by definition, they are the least affected in the group. To see anything here, um, you know, at this age, after these mild challenges is actually quite exciting to us and indicates just how early in the disease process these kinds of cognitive changes may be occurring. And then to give you an idea of how subtle this post kinic acid behavior is, um, I'm going to show you some data using these uh, force play actimeters from BASI. So the software output there in, in the yellow box in the middle looks very much like an EEG. Uh, in fact, though, this is picking up movement using very sensitive force meters at each corner of the chamber. So the three spikes you can see in the top middle panel are actually myoclonic jerks. So we can confirm those using paired video recordings. But this equipment is sensitive enough uh, not just to detect movements like that, but to tell the difference between a mouse with low activity who might be grooming or sniffing in a corner uh, versus a mouse that is actually frozen, as is often uh, observed following treatment with kinic acid or other seizure inducing drugs. So you can see from these data here, um, which show the total uh, bouts of low mobility, um, that APP P71 mice are more likely to exhibit the real immobility than wild type mice following treatment with kinic acid. Uh, it's really quite difficult to pick up with the naked eye, um, but this is what led us to now look at the EEG data to get a stronger picture of what was really happening in the brains of these mice. And you'll also notice that data set um, there on the bottom right is, is just 20 minutes following treatment, and only during about 10 minutes of that do we detect a significant difference. So again, at these low doses, we're looking at a, a very short, acute effect of drug. So uh, here is where we get to the EEG part of the data. And to complete these studies, we use the DSI system, which has a number of advantages for our study design. So for those of you who are not familiar, instead of a traditional head mount tethered system, the DSI telemeter implants are surgically placed just above the hip and the wiring is tunneled under the skin so that the EEG wires are placed in holes drilled in the skull touching the surface of the brain, just like with uh, any other EEG setup. The EMG wires are secured in the nuchal muscles at the back of the neck and nothing is protruding. The mice heal really nicely and they can be maintained for long periods of time with the telemeters in place. They're turned on and off just by waving a magnet near them um, and that allows for really long term recordings if needed. So the example in the image below shows uh, paired video data with the EEG. Um, this is a mouse, uh, a mouse in the middle of a seizure event. It's actually not from this study. Again, we were looking for mice without these seizure events. Um, you can see, hopefully, um, behind the food cup, there is a mouse uh, in the characteristic sort of rigid posture with a tail extension. Um, he's hiding, so the yellow there marks the head, the back, and the feet, and then the, the red line is the tail extension. So um, perhaps you can see him uh, hiding there you know, in, in the midst of a seizure. The other benefit of the, this system is that although uh, the mice are a little bit lumpy by the time we finish with them, um, there are no other impairments to movement really, and that allows us to complete behavioral testing in the same set of animals. And that's what we did here in this study. So we did four weeks of EEG recordings during which time the mice received those twice per week kinic acid treatments. Um, this time we had learned our lesson and we went back down to five mg per kg. Again, looking at very small changes, small but chronic changes. And then following those recordings, the mice underwent a week or so of some behavioral testing so that we could get measures from within the same animals that we had EEG recordings. So first of all, uh, in line with the human data I described earlier, we're not looking for actual convulsive seizures. We did observe seizures in one APPP someone female and one wild type female treated with kinic acid during the study. Those mice were removed from all of the analyses. Uh, two male APPP SEN1 treated with kinic acid died during the study, uh, presumably from seizures. Uh, we only caught one of those on the EEG system, um, and so all data from both of those mice were removed as well. So again, you know, we're trying to catch the animals with uh, what could be termed clinically silent changes, um, and again, which are the least impacted in the group. So in this first observation, 
we counted the number of spikes or spike trains, polyspikes, which had no associated behavioral signal, either by EMG or by the paired video. And you can see those in the middle panel on the left, highlighted by the green bar and by the arrow. You know, we also saw some spikes that did have a small EMG signal associated. Uh, these are confirmed on video as a small head bob behavior, and that's, um, you know, representing a small myoclonic jerk. But as you can see at this age, uh, there's very little difference between the wild type and the APP P71 mice at baseline uh, or under saline treatment. Uh, following kinic acid treatment, much like with the LTP and behavioral studies, there's a far greater response in the APPP than one mice. And those were um, significant increases. It's just not marked on the, um, on the panels there. So these specific signals are all automatically detected using the NeuroScore program, but we do go through by hand, confirm all of the markers placed by the program. We also remove any instances of signal dropouts. And of course, we just want to get a stronger picture of what is happening in each mice. So we, we do do a lot of, of hand coding of these data as well. Um, afterwards. We also use the NeuroScore automated analyses to help with passing out the data according to the frequency of EEG signal. Now data from human studies show changes in delta, theta, and alpha frequency signals, and the magnitude of those changes may well be linked to the fact that the, the biggest changes observed um, in many studies are during sleep, both in REM and non-REM sleep, and those are mostly registered as uh, delta or theta. We also use the NeuroScore data and um, guide parameters provided by DSI to confirm patterns of sleep and wake and found very little difference between the genotypes you know, at this age. So these recordings were all made during a four hour period during the light cycle when mice should mostly be sleeping, uh, which you can see that they are, although about 30% of this time is classed as awake. We were able to perform these studies in a dedicated housing room. So other than daily checks by the veterinary staff, which typically occur in the mornings, or when investigators you know, from our lab were in the room, there is really very little to disturb the mice. We even have the computers outside of the room so that they aren't bothered by that noise either. And although um, we did observe genotype differences in the different power bands, uh, those are marked by the asterisks, and you can see we have the data broken out into REM sleep, non-REM, and uh, wakeful periods. We didn't pull out any, um, you know, additional, any clear additional effects of the kinic acid treatment. We're also not able to pull out specific changes in the delta frequencies, which was where, you know, we had predicted the most changes would be. But this um, indicated to us that the spikes we observed were perhaps, you know, a discrete and specific marker of change, um, not related to overall EEG readouts or overall disruption in sleep patterns. And so they might have some predictive value. So as I mentioned, one benefit of the DSI system is that we can perform behavior in the same mice that we have the EEG recordings from. Something like the water maze is perhaps not ideal since the implant, implants might impair swimming. So instead we focused on fear conditioning. Uh, during the initial trial, um, our mice are trained to associate a 30 second tone with a 0.5 milliamp shock that co-terminates with the tone. And we use three tone shock pairings across an eight minute trial during our training paradigm. So 24 hours later, mice were placed back in the same testing context and we look at freezing behavior to assess memory for the shock. So all of the mice, again, learned this association. Um, you can see that from the increased freezing uh, when placed back in the context compared to baseline freezing behavior that's in the top left-hand panel. Um, and that's as you might expect, again, in young animals, even in the transgenics at this age, we don't typically see a lot of um, cognitive uh, deficits. So as before with the water maze data, it was not until we used the slightly harder aspect of this trial, um, of this task, and that's the response to the cue, which was the tone in a non-familiar context, that we saw a deficit emerge in the kinic acid APPP-SEM1 treated mice. 
Um, so this part of the task is thought to be more dependent on intact amygdala function rather than just hippocampal based learning. Uh, there are kinate receptors in both areas, um, but it's interesting to us to think that the circuitry involved here may not just be corticohippocampal, which is um, often what's discussed um, in these in these data sets. So what's causing these effects? Well, uh, down regulation of EAAT2, uh, also known as GLT1 protein on astrocytes, is associated with elevated glutamate levels and neurotoxicity. Since this is the major protein responsible for clearing glutamate into astrocytes, this is perhaps not surprising. Um, several post-mortem studies indicate that GLT1 levels are decreased during Alzheimer's in concert with increased astrocyte activation. Um, and so that's picked up in this um, case on the right by uh, increased GFAP staining uh, or Western blot at the same time as they have um, decreased GLT1. So I'm showing here our data now, uh, Western blot data from the cortex, since that's where our EEG recordings were made. Um, but we also saw similar response to this in hippocampal tissue. So at this age, by Western blot, we did not have any changes in GFAP levels, suggesting that the mice are relatively spared from gross neuroinflammation at this point. Um, and that's you know, likely sensitive and responsive to amyloid levels as those build up uh, over time at, at later ages. We did, however, see decreased GLT-1 expression in both wild-type and APPP-71 mice in response to kinic acid with a cumulative effect in the kinic acid-treated transgenic animals. So there's reason to believe that our treatments were having some direct and lasting impact on glutamate homeostasis and that that may be important in the behavioral outputs that we saw. So I hope that those experiments together convinced you that even very mild perturbations in glutamate signaling can impact cognition and that this can be observed through changes in EEG even in very young animals and at very early stages of disease. And given this, it becomes particularly important to identify alternate triggers of glutamatergic dysfunction and hyperexcitability. So here are just a few examples. Um, each of these are associated with electrographic uh, non-convulsive seizures and increased likelihood of an Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. So air pollution, um, you know, there's a lot of factors um, uh, in, in air pollution. I think this uh, image is Mexico City, um, but manganese is, is one of the um, factors that's involved there. We also study manganese um, in the diet in my lab um, and, and there are several neurotoxic effects, particularly in cases where, you know, people might obtain, uh, you know, water th from uh, from wells. We have increased manganese, people exposed um, during during workplace uh, exposures as well. Uh, glutamine synthetase is a manganese dependent enzyme critical in glutamate recycling, uh, but in uh, excess manganese is neurotoxic and can therefore impact glutamatergic function through other oxidative stress mechanisms as well. Um, there are other interesting stories recently in the literature involving direct triggering of glutamatergic systems, contributing, con contributing to acute onset of cognitive decline and seizures, so in the case of domoic acid, um, or more long-term changes in the case of the flying foxes up there. You know, we're studying the roles of manganese right now in my lab and additional studies um, also considering the roles of repeated mild traumatic brain injuries and acute illness, including delirium on development of Alzheimer's disease. And we're using EEG as a tool in all of these projects. Uh, we hope to be able to share data from those studies over the next uh, 12 months. But the first three examples, whether direct neurotoxins or not, are actually all also acquired through diet, uh, you know, whether on purpose or accidentally. And the interesting thing about dietary studies is that sometimes we study excess toxins and sometimes we study uh, deficiency. And, you know, this talk um, is about environmental influences on EEG as well as Alzheimer's development. And one dietary factor I have always enjoyed working with is vitamin C or ascorbic acid and its roles as a specific neuromodulator as well as a powerful antioxidant. So most people are aware of the condition of extreme ascorbic acid deficiency, that's scurvy. And scurvy is rare, it's not unheard of. Uh, that's actually not what we study. Um, we study depletion you know, and deficiency that, that is not scurvy. And those are actually quite common, particularly in older populations at risk of Alzheimer's disease. 
And one reason that humans are susceptible to vitamin C deficiency is because along with other primates, with guinea pigs and fruit bats, uh, we have a non-functional copy of the enzyme glonolactone oxidase that's required for vitamin C synthesis in the liver. So all other animals, importantly, including you know lab rodents, rats and mice, make their own vitamin C and therefore can never become deficient. So for humans, for us, it's not hard to get sufficient vitamin C in the diet. But even at recommended uh, dietary intake levels, it's also reasonably easy to have less than replete levels. So you can see marked in the, the first smaller uh, red box, if you take the recommended daily intake level of uh, between 45 and 120 um, milligrams per day, and that depends on age, sex, um, you know, pregnancy status, and in fact, different countries have different guidelines, um, those amounts are not going to get you to a replete status. You need more like 250 or more mix per day to, to get you there. And the reason that vitamin C is particularly relevant to the current story relates directly to glutamate transport. So as glutamate is released into the synapse, it binds NMDA or AMPA receptors and calcium influxes into the cell. You know, then it needs to be efficiently cleared from the synapse before it can become excitotoxic. And around 90% of the glutamate in the synaptic cleft is cleared through GLT-1 on the astrocyte. Um, as glutamate is taken up, the astrocyte swells and that leads to opening of these volume regulated anion channels. And that allows ascorbic acid to be released into the synapse at exactly the time that glutamate is present and additional antioxidant protection might be required. It's then also available for uptake by neurons on the SVCT2, which is the sodium dependent uh, vitamin C transporter. Um, and so if, if the neurons are under stress, they can increase their antioxidant protection that way. Uh, you know, following donation of electrons to neutralize any reactive oxygen species in the synapse, ascorbic acid uh, in the extracellular fluid becomes oxidized to dehydroascorbic acid, that's DHA. Uh, that's then taken up on glucose transporters in the astrocyte uh, because, you know, while neurons have the SVCT2, astrocytes do not, so they, they take up the oxidized version of ascorbate. Within the astrocyte, the, the DHA is then reduced back to ascorbate or vitamin C, which is then available for release again. And so these two processes of glutamate clearance and ascorbate release are really intimately tethered. And it used to be deemed a hetero exchange, although that does not fully explain the relationship. Stimulating cells or applying glutamate uh, absolutely causes ascorbate release. You know, that's clear, um, but how or whether ascorbate level itself impacts glutamate uptake is less clear. But if ascorbate is not available, then you have potential for damage to neurons, increased oxidative stress imbalance at the synapse, and potential post-translational modifications of transporters like GLT-1, which is sensitive to oxidative stress. So how did we go about testing the hypothesis that low ascorbate was interfering with glutamate signaling. Um, first thing we did, we took Gulo knockout mice. So they are like us. They cannot synthesize their own ascorbic acid. Um, so they have to receive it from the diet. And we kept them on a high wild type equivalent vitamin C level or on low levels for one month. And the levels that we kept them on are not enough to induce scurvy. They give them about a 50% decrease in brain vitamin C levels, but there's no ill health, no weight loss, nothing like that. And you can see in the panel on the left that under these lower vitamin C conditions, mice were far more sensitive to the kinic acid with a faster onset latency to that first head bob uh, behavior. Um, and many of the wild type mice never show that behavior. Again, 10 mg per kg kinic acid is not a, you know, a large dose in otherwise uh, healthy mice. And, you know, our contention is that this kind of depletion is, is possible in humans because this is not a, an unhealthy level that would send you to the doctor, but it's uh, you know, a poor diet or a smoker that uses up the rest of their vitamin C stores. Uh, we tried to look at this a little more closely in SVCT2 heterozygous knockout mice. So these mice are lacking 50% of that specific vitamin C transporter in the neurons. That leads to about a 20 to 30% decrease in brain ascorbate, so not as large a difference, uh, even though those mice can synthesize their own ascorbate in the liver. 
Uh, these data required using a pinnacle system that has a mouse tethered to the receiving device and, uh, you know, ideally is used for only shorter term measurements of around, you know, 24 hours uh, in order to support mouse well-being. So although we saw that both knockout of SVCT2 and APPP1 genotype alone, you know, slightly increased the spikes observed in the animals following kinic acid, the largest differences we observed were only seen in the combination case of decreased ascorbic acid and APPPSEM1 mutations. And that suggests to us that there's you know, some effect of low vitamin C accelerating the deficits observed according to um, the AD genotype. So the nice thing about the untethered EEG system that we use now is that you can plan really longitudinal measurements. And this is handy for a number of environmental or pharmacological based studies. In this study here, um, and I have to caution that this is still ongoing, um, has not undergone any peer review at this point. We're still actually adding um, a few more animals in. We horribly lost one cohort of animals during the beginning of the, the COVID shutdown. We had to uh, close out that um, study quickly. So we are a little behind in finishing up this data set. Um, but this is uh, testing the effect of chronic vitamin C depletion with no additional challenge. So in this case, no kinic acid in both young and aged APPP one mice. And based on uh, all of our other studies with the kinic acid, we hypothesized that the lower the brain vitamin C levels became, the more of the aberrant spike activity we would see. And we used a within subjects design in which ascorbate levels were slowly decreased in all of the mice, uh, which we hoped would be more powerful given the likelihood of greater variability in these older mice. We've got four and a half month old mice and uh, 18 to 19 month old mice um, in this study. And all of these mice are GULO knockouts or are dependent on dietary vitamin C. And then half of them also have the APPP SIM1 mutations. So in the first week, we actually did see what we were expecting. We have um, approaching significance um, here, even with just four mice, three or four mice in each group. Um, you can see also the expected effect of increased spikes according to genotype. Um, in the older mice, you can see uh, more spike activity at baseline, both the wild types, particularly the APPP sum one mice, and also any potential effect there of the uh, vitamin C depletion is greater in the APPP sum one mice. But of course, nothing is ever as simple as we would like. And over consecutive weeks of depletion, we observed no further increase in any of the groups. And in the aged mice, we saw what looked like a recovery of this activity. So I do not want to suggest at all that decreased dietary vitamin C could be protective of, of brain health. We have a lot of information to show that this is not true. Um, so we definitely wanted to study this phenomenon a little more closely. But what is clear here is that there is a complicated story that requires longitudinal measurements for us to fully understand. You know, taking a snapshot approach in this kind of study um, would obviously lose us an awful lot of data. So as one additional marker, we used uh, the root mean square of uh, all the overall signal. Uh, it's a calculation that loosely provides a measure of the overall power or activity in the signal. Uh, this should be reasonably stable, but is generally depleting over time in the aged mice. Um, and so may reflect some form of lower engagement or even neural fatigue uh, in the cortex. We have not fully interpreted these data yet. Um, it's interesting to us that there is a generalized difference in the data that we observe in the aged mice over time that we do not see in the younger mice. If anything, the younger mice are w working harder, you know, with, a, with an increased signal over time. Um, so as we complete our final cohort of animals um, and add in the extra data, we will be using multiple different analyses um, through the Neuroscore program to better understand what all of these data mean. So finally, in these animals, um, at 12 months now, uh, representing a, an in-between time point for the two age groups used in that EEG study, uh, we see at this time, you know, we do have astrogliosis reflected by the increased GFAP in the APPP SEM1 mice. Uh, because of this, we normalized to GFAP rather than just actin. Um, and we see here the expected decrease in GLT-1 according to genotypes. So that's pretty clear. Um, but again, there's no difference according to our other experimental manipulation of a score weight level. And that suggests that whatever these changes are, um, you know, whatever they're caused by, it's, it's not as simple as just glutamate clearance. So in future, we'll be um, combining these studies 
um, looking at uh, glutamate release under different triggered conditions using in vivo sensors such as iGlu sniffer. We have some GLT-1 conditional knockout mice that we will use to probe specific, you know, the role of specific brain areas. Um, and there are, of course, multiple other contributing mechanisms, as described earlier. And many of these are specifically implicated with roles of ascorbic acid, including dopaminergic function, cholinergic changes, oxidative stress mechanisms, and mitochondrial damage, and many more. So to conclude, um, increasing amounts of data from animal and human studies show that subclinical and non-convulsive seizure activity are an early part of Alzheimer's pathophysiology, and they may be sufficient to trigger cognitive decline in some groups. Specific EEG markers uh, could therefore be a useful early predictor of later cognitive decline and in fact help identify specific subgroups that may be amenable to preventative pharmacological interventions. Um, diet and environmental exposures may contribute to cumulative damage throughout life. And if we can better understand these roles and how to manipulate them to our benefit, this could also provide new insights on possible interventions. Uh, with that, I would like to acknowledge the funding bodies that have supported this work, both at the NIH and the VA. Um, but uh, even more importantly, I want to acknowledge my outstanding colleagues and lab members. So Dr. Bill Nobis performed the LTP studies for us and continues to support and train folks in my lab to perform the electrophysiological studies. He's also a neurologist who reads uh, real human EEGs, not just mouse data, so has been a, a great help in interpreting these data as well. The EEG analyses themselves were all performed by um, graduate students, Rebecca Buchanan at the bottom and David Consoli, and by postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Jordan Wilcox. And so with that, thank you all for your attention and I am happy to take some questions. Fantastic, well, thank you so much, Dr. Harrison, for the really fantastic presentation and for sharing your work with us. This is a really interesting avenue for research. All right, so let's jump in uh, first question, so given this possible direct link between the increasing abnormal epileptiform activity and memory impairments, are there any behaviors that are likely to be particularly sensitive to seizure phenotypes or to kyanic acid if tested experimentally? Yeah, so there are studies in, um, in, in patients that were cited earlier in the talk that used a number of of complex measures, um, you know, a lot of different test batteries. And they found sensitivity to epilepsy in some of those outputs, but not others. Um, of course, many of those tasks like clock drawing or, you know, serial subtractions are not necessarily relevant to everyday life um, in, in patients. Um, but this does tend to suggest that different pathways or circuits are impacted. So in mice, you know, since we think that the um, epilepsy is driving the same pathways that are impacted early in disease, I think that many of the classic tests of learning and memory that are dependent on intact corticohippocampal circuits, you know, are implicated. So really anything that your mouse model um, has deficits in any way, uh, might be accelerated by the additional um, epilepsy phenotype. So for us testing in young mice, the most important thing is probably not the specific task used, um, but that all of the correct control tasks are included. So we're controlling for activity and anxiety and, and you know, motor deficits, for example, that helps us interpret the, the final, you know, the most important output that we're interested in. And because we were testing in young mice that really had pretty intact performance on most of these tasks, it's, it's uh, easy to get a ceiling effect and to not see your deficit. So it's essential to have tasks that you can adapt the protocols for in order to make harder. So for us, that was reversal learning in the water maze using um, you know, cued and, and context dependent tasks and conditioned fear. Um, other tasks people use, you might want to um, you know, decrease the amount of training or increase test delays, for example, anything that's going to prevent that ceiling effect and allow you to detect differences between your groups. Fantastic, great answer. Uh, here's a great question here. So you were saying that the EEG data reported in the APP PSEN one mice were made during the day, uh, which is the light phase for the mice. Uh, do you think you would have expected different results if you'd done your testing during their more active dark phase? Yeah, I, I do think we would see some different results, not um, 
not different enough to lead to alternate conclusions, but the magnitude of effects may vary. So what was interesting, you know, we, when we had spontaneous deaths, um, it was not, uh, in our studies, it was not immediately following the treatments. These mice died overnight when they're in the active phases. So uh, we were looking during our day or the, the, the mice's um, sleep cycle because we, were, we did, you know, that's, that, that's sort of relevant to the clinical testing. And because we're not looking for seizures, we're looking for these more subtle measurements. So um, we did take 24 hour or 48 hour recordings. So we have the ability to go through and, and look at those data. And there's definitely it's worth looking at all of it. But I think we'd be answering slightly different experimental questions if we did that. So, you know, we chose in, in this data that I presented here um, that hopefully will be out out um, soon. We wanted to look at this window immediately after the kinic acid administration, so we could see the increase in sensitivity to treatments over time. But there's certainly definitely a role for looking at 24-hour measurements and, and including that light dark cycle in there as well. Fantastic. Uh, question here about the decrease in survival. Was there any indication of kindling that could have caused that uh, the decrease in survival? Well, I mean, I think that's what it is. Yeah, so there is definitely some um, some deaths over time in any of these colonies. That's That's been known for a long time. Anyone that keeps colonies of any of these APP mutant um, animals knows that we do have, you know, spontaneous seizures. But the fact that we had so many more in these mice after kinic acid treatment. Uh, we also see the same thing when we decrease um, vitamin C level on top of the APPP, someone mice were more likely to use mice. And I think that is a, a, a cumulative effect of small seizure events, which, which is kindling, um, it eventually leading to mortality. So yes, I do believe that that's what's happening here. Fantastic. Um... All right, next question here. What do you think is the most pathophysiologically pathophysi accurate transgenic mouse model of Alzheimer's disease? Um, oh, I mean, I assume that it's it's kind of depends on what you're looking at, but what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it 100% depends on what you're looking at. Yeah, that is a fantastic question. And um, if I could answer that question, I would be, you know, far more advanced um, in life than I am now. So I we are using this model knowing that it is an imperfect model um, because it because it's a model and it's modeling the, the the pathophysiology that we are interested in which right now is this you know um, slight altered EEG signal um, and you know we're also interested for example in um, neuroinflammatory changes and so we need plaques to exist so we can look at how microglia react um, during plaques but that's not the same <clears throat> excuse me, that's not the same as saying we have a mouse with Alzheimer's disease. We're modeling one facet of disease. So, you know, some people um, take the approach of putting in more mutations. So now we have tau, you know, tau pathology and amyloid pathology. Um, some people like to increase the mutation so you can see it in younger mice. Well, you know, you could also argue that, you know, Alzheimer's is a disease of aging. So if we're looking at these um, changes in mice that are not also undergoing normal age related changes is that relevant um, now we have a lot of new models with you know trem2 variants or you know different um, gene changes that come from uh, rather th from the spontaneous alzheimer's disease rather than the familial inherited alzheimer's disease i think you can choose any model you want that suits your purpose, you just have to be really acutely aware of the weaknesses of, of the model. And there are weaknesses in all of these models. Um, you know, we like to, I'll, I'll say joke in the lab that all mouse models are wrong because they all synthesize vitamin C. And so the entire oxidative environment is different to the human brain. So we know that, that mice are not little humans. Um, we just use them for the, um, you know, for whatever it is we need out of them. So so in this case, we wanted the altered EEG changes. And so any of the models that have that would probably work for these types of studies. Um, but depending on what you're looking at, you may need to, to go with a different model. There is no good answer. It's a wonderful question. There's no good answer for that question. Fantastic. Yeah, that's a great answer to a really difficult question. Um, all right, so next question. Um, all right, so thank you very much. Very interesting. I would like to ask about the absorption of vitamin C as part of the supplementation of mice, uh, glucose, for example. Uh, 
say that again, how, how the mice absorb it. Okay, yeah, glucose, about the absorption of vit vitamin C as a part of the supplementation. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but so in, in our Gulo knockout mice, um, we, we know that the, the brain levels and the organ levels, you know, correlate strongly with what we give them. So they do absorb them. There is a different transporter in the intestine, the SVCT1, that's responsible for uptake of, of vitamin C. And so um, we know that they do absorb it readily. You can, you can max that out. You can replete those, um, you know, transporters. And so there's a limit to how much you can you can get into the mouse, but but if you give it to them in the diet, they do absorb it. Most rodent models, guinea pigs are the exception, but most rodent models would not have vitamin C in um, in their normal diet because you would not um, they they do not need it. So I'm not sure about the why glucose is um, glucose, for example. I'm not quite sure what what that means. As far as I know, there's no interaction between glucose and vitamin C absorption uh, because there is that specific transporter. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I hope so. Fantastic. And I think uh, in the interest of time, we'll just have one last question today. Uh, do you think these data and studies like it mean that people should start taking anti-epileptics as a preventative treatment for Alzheimer's disease? <laughs> so, you know, of course, it would be great to argue that there's a simple, you know, answer like that. But, it, you know, it's a really nuanced argument because, you know, first of all, there are um, patients that undergo, you know, sudden changes in cognition. And it's because of seizures. And when those are detected and you treat the seizures, they recover almost completely. So, you know, yes, there are cases where that that is the case. But in terms of preventative it may be that there are people that benefit, but I, we do not understand enough to, you know, to know who those people would be. We need to understand who would benefit from these. And then what are the correct types of anti-epileptics that would be um, beneficial? Because, of course, we also have side effects. We don't want to be, you know, constantly treating people with, with every drug we have. So, um, yes. I think in future there may be subgroups that benefit from some types of, of anti-epileptic medication. Um, right now, we certainly can't just start throwing that at people and hoping for the best. All right, fantastic. Um, well, thanks so much, Fiona, for the really great insights today. It's been a real pleasure having you with us. Well, thank you so much, Liam. Thank you for inviting me. Definitely. Uh, and a big thanks to the audience also for joining us for the event. Uh, and last but certainly not least, we'd like to thank DSI for sponsoring it. And so in closing, thanks again for taking part in this Inside Scientific webinar. And we look forward to having you with us again soon. Have a great day, everyone.